Welcome to our Monticello live stream. Today, we're going to be talking about how families at Monticello, both enslaved and free, celebrated the holidays and talk about some of the customs and traditions found on the mountaintop. Today, we're joined by Associate Curator Emily Johnson and by Bill Barker, first person interpreter of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, thank you all for joining us online today and uh, let us know where you're joining from and leave any questions for us in the comments. Well, Emily, we have quite a number of questions already from our, our visitors. So uh, may I take the liberty of asking you uh, the first one? I would be delighted, Bill, thank you. And there we are. Uh, Emily, in your extensive research into the holiday period at Monticello, what are some of the differences between Jefferson's time and our time in how the holidays are celebrated? Bill, that's such a great question because it made, I really wanted to think about what are similarities between the way we celebrate the holidays now and in the past, and what are some differences, and maybe even what are some things that surprise us. So one of the things that I was thinking about that, that's really similar is it's the holidays are times of special food and drinks. Um, it's time for families and friends to come together it's time for gatherings, it's time for games. The, the special kind of slowing downness of the holiday, I think are, are some real wonderful similarities that, that we can look to. But ways that things are different, one of the things that I've realized is kind of the orientation of the holiday. So I feel like for most of us, holiday parties happen generally before December 25th. Um, but in Jefferson's time, December 25th really seems to be the kickoff of the season. Um, some people today continue to celebrate the 12 days, the, the 12 days in, in song to Epiphany. But in Jefferson, that was really a pivotal point of celebration um, that really began with the 25th of December. So that was something that I noticed was kind of different. Um, there's a funny kind of, it's, when we when we think about the holidays in the past, we really try to go into the correspondence to understand as much as we can from the letters that people wrote to one another about what they did. And so there's this kind of funny, somewhat complainy letter from John Wales Epps, who was Jefferson's son-in-law, of course, writing about, and this is in 1819, he's writing to his son, and he's basically saying, Christmas isn't what it used to be. He says, you know, now we just kind of have a feast, but before you really, you took some time, you took some days, you really kind of rested and relaxed and, and got some, some time before the new year kicked off again. And he says, you know, some people still do that, but that really seems to be out of fashion these days. <laughs> so I guess even for John Wales Epps, uh, considering that uh, Christmas was a time where you enjoy and, and associate with one and the other, it didn't mean that Christmas was beginning after Halloween. No. <laughs> <laughs> or as I remember when we were growing up, immediately after Thanksgiving with Black Friday. So. That's right. Maybe maybe John Wells Ups would have preferred that. Said, <laughs> it's yeah. just not the way it used to be. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Well, so I was thinking, Bill, and one of the questions that we got can you tell us a little bit about the religious celebration of the holiday? Can you tell us how Jefferson and his family um, celebrated the holiday? And can you, did it change as Jefferson transitioned from a British Anglican mm. to an American Episcopalian? Yes, so true. Uh, so much changed because when Jefferson was born and grew up, uh, living in Virginia, of course, uh, Virginia and the majority of the former British colonies in North America uh, were governed by the Church of England as they were governed by the, the monarchy. There were two exceptions, uh, Rhode Island, of course, um, and Pennsylvania, uh, where true freedom for religion uh, reigned in Rhode Island, the Baptists, and in Pennsylvania, uh, the Quakers. But in Virginia, uh, well, Jefferson was born and brought up of the Church of England. Uh, in fact, his father, Colonel Peter Jefferson, was a vestryman of the Church of England, St. Anne's Parish. And uh, so you had to attend to 
the ecclesiastical laws of the Church of England, and particularly to recognize the 12 days of Christmas, uh, Christmas being the initiation of that, and then 12th night, January 6th, uh, the day before Epiphany being, of course, uh, that recognition. So uh, it required uh, first that you pay a tax for the support of the Church of England. No matter what your religious opinion, everyone had to pay the tithing to the Church of England. Uh, if you wanted to marry, and many marriages took place during uh, uh, Christmas tide, on Christmas, uh, let alone the first of the year. Although when Jefferson was born, of course the first of the year was being celebrated more or less in the middle of March because Jefferson was born during the Julian calendar. That didn't change until 1752. But you had to purchase a marriage license from the Church of England. And by law, you had to worship in the Church of England at least 12 Sundays a year. Uh, on the average, one Sunday a month. And of course, that one Sunday in December would have definitely been by many uh, Christmas, uh, or in and about Christmas you would have attended. So with the... Uh, Breaking away from uh, the monarchy of England, we broke away from the Church of England. That is when truly freedom for religion, religious freedom, uh, began to uh, uh, become more and more the norm uh, in our young nation. And Jefferson well, authored the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. So he certainly did continue to attend to church. Uh, he sat on the... Uh, Board of Directors of the Virginia Bible Society. I believe he remained a vestryman of St. Anne's Parish. He helped to found what has become the American Episcopal Church uh, in Virginia. So he remained uh, attentive to his, um, his ecclesiastical duties within the Episcopal Church of Virginia. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. So, you know, one of the ways that many people celebrate the holiday is by attending to a religious service today. Another very popular way to celebrate is Christmas dinner. Mm. Can you talk, tell us a little bit about how Christmas dinner, what, what Christmas dinner was like here at Monticello, when it might have taken place, who was here? Well, you know, uh, the interesting thing, Emily, is that Jefferson does not refer to Christmas too often in his writings, does he? But he does refer to Christmas dinner uh, every once in a great while, and uh, he enjoyed his Christmas dinner because it was an opportunity to have family all about the table and particularly visitors. And as we know, Jefferson certainly enjoyed his, uh, his native fair, Virginia fair, to be placed upon the table and particularly served in the French fashion and with French recipes. So they would have meats available at the table. I know that he appreciated ham uh, at the dinner table at Christmas time. Isn't it his daughter who, or grandchild that makes a wonderful, prepares a great ham with cloves and the like? I think so. And there's actually a letter from 1827 up in Boston, Jefferson's grandson-in-law, the box has holiday shipping mishaps have also been a, <laughs> um, a longstanding tradition. <laughs> uh, Joseph Coolidge writes to his sister-in-law, Cornelia, saying, the box didn't come, we didn't have your Christmas ham. Ah, there it is. What a lament for everyone, let alone Mr. Jefferson at the table. Uh, they would have small beer. Uh, they would have cider, of course. Apples. Jefferson refers to crates and barrels of apples uh, to be procured at this time of year. So uh, that would be used particularly for mince pies. And Jefferson does refer to the Christmas dinner as a time for mince uh, pies to be prepared there at the table. Um, and eggnog, they had eggnog that was uh, prepared, yes, with whiskey, uh, rum. We know that uh, George Washington enjoys a particular recipe for a rather potent eggnog. I think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these, uh, uh, these victuals and libations brought people closer and closer uh, together. Uh, he also enjoyed uh, what we know was called a snow egg. Uh, a snow egg was a prepared meringue in the shape of an egg uh, floating more or less on top of a custard. And uh, that uh, was a recipe he brought back from France known as Il Flottant, but of course. It's fascinating to think about and to think about, we also have a reference, I believe, to plum pudding. Ah. There's a, again, in the, in the granddaughter's correspondence, this is much later, this is decades later, 
but I believe one of the granddaughters writes to her sister and asks if she can have the recipe for Monticello plum pudding. Oh. So one of the fun things that we've been able to do um, it, with the decorations in the house, we try, when we decorate the house for the holidays, we really try to base everything on documented evidence. Yeah. And so here we have this reference that plum pudding was a, was a holiday staple at Monticello. So there is, if any of you come on the holiday evening tours, we'll have to see if anybody can spot the plum pudding um, or if you can spot the plum pudding in preparation uh, down in the kitchen. <laughs> we hope you do visit during the uh, holiday evening tours because uh, the floral arrangements inside the house, whereas not uh, uh, profuse and abundant, overly done, are done in the most beautifully sublime and elegant style. Are they not? They really are. Lou Hatch, I believe, and those working with her have provided a, a, a wonderful display. I think you'll find just beautifully appointed in all of the different places. Absolutely. And it really gives, it gives such a warm and festive air to, to the house. And we even have in the decorations, we do, we have a wonderful reference to the family who lived in Monticello after Jefferson. We have a uh -huh. reference to the Levy family. There's a a kissing ball that hangs from the light fixture in the entrance hall. And these are more of a decorative element, more typical to the 1840s and 1850s, which of course was the mm. Levy family's period, right. part of the Levy family's period of occupation here. The Levies were Jewish, and so they would have celebrated Hanukkah at Monticello. And we don't know very much about their celebrations either, but mm. I love thinking about Jefferson with his, with his belief in the freedom of religion with this house hosting so many different people's traditions, so mm. many different religious traditions. It seems really appropriate. It's so true. Thank heaven for the levies. Mm -hmm. This is the reason we have all of this to be able to share amongst ourselves today. Absolutely. Uh, Emily, um, what kind of uh, uh, experiences and traditions and uh, gatherings and travelings uh, were experienced with the enslaved families. Uh, were there particular customs around visiting uh, food and gifts that they would en enjoy and, uh, and prefer? I'm so glad you asked that, Bill. So for the enslaved community, again, we have, in the same that we have for the Jefferson and the Randolph families, we have references and letters that tell us, that give us little glimpses into what the holiday period was like for enslaved families. For, for people who generally worked outside for people who worked in the fields and the gardens people who were craftspeople artisans they generally had a day or two off there was generally a little bit of time around christmas where people were not expected to work um, we believe that december so around the holiday period was a time when jefferson gave out the annual distributions of fabric for clothing wow. um, supplies like bedding. Um, and there may have been some extra extra gifts given at that time. There's very few records around that. But we know that people, therefore, and some people more than others, of course, but people had a little bit of time and maybe a little bit of, of extra or at least new or fresher clothing. So you can kind of read between the lines, like you have to do so often when you're trying to understand the experiences of the enslaved people, that it may have been a time where people were able to present themselves as they wanted to, where you were able to come out wearing fresh clothing, where you were able to maybe, maybe over the year you had, someone had earned some money and had been able to buy something to embellish your clothing. This may be a time where people were able to show off some of mm. their senses of personal style or some of their preferences. We know that um, pe some people were able to travel at Christmas. There oh. are references where people are traveling back and forth to Poplar Forest, right. which was Jefferson's plantation down in Bedford County, about 90 miles mm. south of here. We know that a man, um, David Hearn Jr., was able to visit his wife, um, Frances Gillette Hearn, in Washington at, at Christmas yeah. at the president's house. And of course, people had to ask permission to travel. So there's this really wonderful letter 
that I'll be talking about throughout the live stream, um, Jefferson's granddaughter, Mary, writes to her sister, Virginia, at Christmas time in 1821. And one of the things that Mary says in this letter is that she hadn't had to write any passes that year. This is 1821, so it's very curious. Did nobody ask to go anywhere in 1821? Or had all of the requests been denied? Denied. For what? For some reason. And that's, you know, letters are so wonderful because they give us glimpses. Yeah. But they so often just scratch the surface and we don't know what was really happening. And I, I should say that people who worked in the field maybe had some time, but for those who worked in the house, for the cooks, for the room attendants, for the people, who were serving members of the Jefferson family, visitors. It was a very busy time. All of that celebrating, all of that wonderful food and wonderful drink that was being cooked, that people were cooking and people were serving, that was all coming from somewhere. So mm. it, was, it was certainly a, a special time of year in the enslaved community, but some people had a little bit more rest and relaxation than others. For many others, it was extremely busy. Mm -hmm. And when you were quoting uh, John Wales Epps uh, letter earlier and talking about how the, the society now mm -hmm. want to get back to work on the 26th, mm -hmm. uh, it was not so uh, with the enslaved, was it? They, they enjoyed more so the holidays for as long as they wanted to for an they did. And actually, John Wales Epps's letter is very interesting because he refers in his letter to the laboring classes. Yeah. And again, here, who is he talking about? Right. Is he talking about enslaved people just using a euphemism that feels a little foreign to, to modern readers and modern scholars? Mm. Mm. Can I interrupt with a question? Sure. Um, we were just talking about the enslaved people at Monticello. Bridget asked whether Thomas Jefferson's white family might have learned any customs from the enslaved people that lived and worked here. Oh, that's, that's a, a really great question. question. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Um, you know, I think that I think that the Jefferson family. I, We'll talk a little bit about music later, but I think it's worth noting music here. Music is, is definitely a, a celebration and an yeah. expression that passed back and forth between the white and the black communities at Monticello. Um, one of, again, this actually the same letter. This I'm so grateful to Mary Randolph for writing this letter in 1821 because she tells us so much. She talks about she's gone out to the smokehouse, maybe to pick up the ham. And she talks about, she sees someone probably on Mulberry Row playing the violin or playing the fit. She calls it the fiddle. And she says that the fiddler is playing with his head thrown back and there's a group of people around him listening. So we know that it's a man who's playing the instrument it's probably his instrument, and that there are people who aren't being forced to work at this time who have the leisure to sit and enjoy. And we know that music is one of those, I think mm -hmm. the Jefferson family absorbed so much musical enjoyment from members of the enslaved community. Yeah, I think so too. And, and you know, it's interesting to think as, as the decades come along, and, and we get past the, the Civil War, uh, something uniquely American begins to develop in the form of ragtime. Right. And from ragtime into jazz, which is so uniquely uh, a form that has emanated from the enslaved music. And, mm -hmm. and why they, yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. Oh. So Emily, I have a question. Um, was there gift giving during the holidays at Monticello? And do we know of some of the gifts that were given and received? We do know of, of some of the gifts. Again, the gifts are, are small. So this is a place where it's really helpful to kind of, you know, some of these things are really surprising. In 1791, there's a letter from Jefferson's daughter, Mariah, 
she was she was going by Mariah by 1791, yeah. right? And she talks about gift giving, a gift exchange with her sister Martha. And she says that she gave Martha a book, and it's um, it sounds thrilling. It was a um, just it was a a, a moral and instruct. It was moral a group of moral and instructional tales. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Martha needed it. <laughs> But, and then Martha, in her turn, gave Mariah an ivory box and one of her drawings. And then the two sisters had a cousin over, and they gave the cousin Paradise Lost. Oh! So, <laughs> which, again, light, light reading. <laughs> <laughs> I should say. So we have you know, the, the way that we understand gifts, gift giving is that things were small. Um, you know, they could be handmade or something that was personal. We have, um, there's a reference in an 1818 letter to Christmas plums for the children. And I think that's wonderful because this is the age before refrigeration. Yeah. Like plums, plums at Christmas are going to be a, a remarkable thing. Um, we, hmm. we understand that there's this little exchange that people played. It's a game and it's called Christmas gift. And the game, basically someone tries to, to startle somebody else. Hmm. You, you sneak up on somebody and whoever says Christmas gift first, if you say it first, then you have to receive a little something from the person that you sneak up on. So this is a game uh -huh. like children would play it with their parents. Um, Children would try to play it with the enslaved community. You can better believe that the enslaved community always won that game. Mm -hmm. And there's a reference to Francis Epps as a young man at Monticello at Christmas, kind of running around, just yelling, Christmas gift, Christmas gift, Christmas gift. Like he's really <laughs> excited, but maybe doesn't quite get the nuances of the game yet. Oh, isn't that delightful? <laughs> and Jefferson gave um, gifts, of course, to uh, to mm -hmm. all his family. I think um, isn't there? Uh, there are several referrals to um, both Martha seeing something in a in a store, a hat or a dress that yeah. he later bought for her yeah. without her knowledge until it was gifted to her. Wow. And um, did he not gift one of his granddaughters with a book uh, entitled "Mary and Her Cat"? Was I think so. Hmm. I think so. Mr. Jefferson, I think, favored the feline over the canine, did he not? <laughs> Although he had a dog's appetite for books. That's right. <laughs> well, it's funny that he chose that word, isn't it? Uh, yes. To describe himself. Uh, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> I would love to know, what What do you know about, we were talking about music as, a, as that wonderful connection point to between the, the, the white community and the enslaved community here. What do you know about music at the holidays with the Jefferson family? Oh, my. well, they were a musical family. We, so, we know that. He wanted uh, his, his family well instructed in music, you know, in, in both the Spanish and the English guitar and uh, in the piano forte, let alone the spinet and the harpsichord. Uh, we know that uh, his, his wife, Mrs. Jefferson, was quite proficient upon the, uh, the spinet. Uh, he bought a spinet uh, for her. Uh, Jefferson, of course, um, loved the violin, and uh, and evidently he he began to practice at an early age. In fact, there is the story that uh, he was first influenced with. Well, I don't see how you could be born and brought up in the wilderness here uh, without the the fiddle being uh, part of every family's recreation and music. And I'm, who's to say that maybe Peter Jefferson? Uh, could play it and, and did, mm -hmm. uh, let alone the many uh, cousins and families here. But we do know that at Christmas tide, Jefferson is making his way uh, to Williamsburg uh, to attend the first semester at the Old Royal College of William and Mary. This is the winter of 59 and 60. And he pauses uh, for, a, I think, a two week stay at a Nat Dandridge Plantation in Hanover. Now, Nathaniel Dandridge, Colonel Nathaniel Dandridge, is Mar Martha Washington's brother. And it is at uh, the Dandridge plantation that we believe he first meets Patrick Henry. So uh, Jefferson is a young man. As we know, uh, Henry is, is a bit older than, than Jefferson. And uh, we also know that Henry is quite proficient upon the fiddle. 
and regales uh, the company at uh, the plantation for two weeks uh, in his repertory upon the fiddle, perhaps different melodies every evening, everyone joining in, singing who is to say, but young Jefferson's quite influenced. And we think that this is where Jefferson took on the interest of uh, taking up the fiddle and becoming, uh, well, well-practiced. I think he writes uh, several hours a day uh, to become one of the finest violinists in all of Virginia. So Jefferson devoted to, to the fiddle, um, played it uh, for most of his young life, when I say young, up until about uh, 43, 44, when we know um, he breaks his wrist. Well, who knows whether it was this time of the year, but we know he's accompanying Mrs. Causeway, Mrs. Maria Causeway, uh, along the Cour de Rin in Paris, and Augusta Wing comes along, blows her scarf from uh, around her neck, and Jefferson, ever the Virginia Cavalier, never to see a young lady in distress, jumps over a balustrade to retrieve it and breaks his right wrist, wrist fracturing it. And uh, that very day has to become ambidextrous and write with his, his left hand. So music, uh, always a part of Jefferson's life, uh, has to begin a, a second route uh, because he's never able to play the, the violin again. So who's to say? Maybe he dabbles upon the piano forte later on. But certainly his family did and his children did. And family music house were quite mm -hmm. proficient. Mm -hmm. I believe Martha, Martha Randolph was really proficient on the piano forte. She had a dual action piano, or harpsichord, ah. excuse me. So two, two keyboards that she could manage. And apparently she could tune as well, which I've ah. heard is a mark yeah. of really expert knowledge of the instrument yeah. and how it works. Mm. Yes. Okay, excellent. Another audience question from Deborah. Um, so we were talking about music. I thought it might fit in well here. She asked about dancing. How did dancing figure into celebrations at Monticello? What is the, the old statement, the ancient adage, Virginians would rather dance or die? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we used to talk about that at Christmas time in Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. Many dances being held in the Apollo Room of the Raleigh Tavern and thereabouts. Nonetheless, here. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Dancing was a huge part of, of celebrations, uh, celebrations at all times of the year, but especially around Christmas. Um, from what, we, what I've been able to understand since the holiday season really begins with December 25th, again, from letters, we hear people saying, now party season is about to kick off. So December 25th really seems to be the start of a series of balls and parties and dances. And actually I was looking, there's a letter where Thomas Mann Randolph, Jefferson's son-in-law and Martha Randolph, actually they're at Monticello. They leave Monticello on Christmas day to go to Farmington. They go to oh, George Diver's oh, George plantation. Dyson. And they stay there for actually a couple, they come back to, they wait until January 4th to come back to Monticello. But they said on the first of the year, they attended a dance in Charlottesville. Uh -huh. So I think that dancing, you know, where, where music and, and conviviality and celebration come together, dancing is always right there with it. It's always a natural. It certainly is. I, I, uh... I wonder what it must have been like. Can you imagine the dances with enough people that may have begun in the parlor and then uh, flowed into the entrance hall? And, and of course, Jefferson is being, being brought up with sequence dances, the old sequence dances that were very popular in Great Britain uh, that evolved into, through their sequences, what becomes known as the Virginia Reel mm -hmm. and kind. It's amazing. Sort of think about like a much more involved conga line of yes. all these people moving throughout the house. And I'm being very silly, but. <laughs> no, absolutely. If you can imagine it, who can happen? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> who, thinking about, about visiting and about conviviality and all of these wonderful gatherings, who were some of, who were some of the visitors that came to Monticello um, during the holidays? Well, uh, you just mentioned one, and that's George Divers from, from Farmington. Uh, Jefferson and George Divers would visit back and forth frequently across town. They were at opposite ends of the town, uh, somewhat cat-cornered cat -cornered to it. 
Uh, and then uh, we know the Madisons, of course, would certainly visit at this time, Mr. Jefferson visiting the Mad Madisons at Montpelier. Uh, we know, unfortunately, that Jefferson was not here during the Christmas tide or early December for at least two weeks when uh, Monsieur Pierre Samuel Dupont uh, came to visit. Uh, Mr. Jefferson was at Poplar Forest during that time. And so Monsieur Dupont, a, a good friend of Thomas Jefferson's and very influential in the acquisition of New Orleans and Louisiana, uh, stayed for two weeks and delighted the grandchildren, particularly Septima, I believe, with uh, handing out bonbons. Mm. Uh, the Septima uh, always remembered she was but a young girl at the time, maybe five, six, seven years of age, and she remembered uh, for the rest of her life uh, both Mr. Dupont and the bonbons that were given out to her. Uh, we know that, um, oh, uh, uh, George Tinkner, uh, George Tinkner, who had visited earlier with um, uh, Key, was Francis Callie Gray. Greg, Francis Callie Gray. The two of them as young men visited here uh, were deeply influenced by that visit with Thomas Jefferson. And later on, uh, George Tinkner returns after he's married, I presume, to introduce his, his new bride to Thompson, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he, of course, returns to Boston, where he becomes, does he not, the head of the Anthenaeum. I believe so. And of the Anthenaeum uh, in Boston. We know Daniel Webster uh, visits Monticello at uh, Christmas time. And we also know that right after our victory uh, in the American Revolution at uh, Yorktown, Mr. Jefferson, who quite fortunately that previous June of 1781 escaped the clutches uh, of the British when he was nearly captured here at Monticello by, uh, by um, well, the British dragoons and that I believe Mr. Jefferson uh, overwhelmed along with his, his wife still living at that time in the uh, late autumn and early winter of 1781 invite uh, General Horatio Gates and George Wythe to come spend Christmas with them here at, uh, at Monticello. Now we don't know whether that ever happened I believe. What's fascinating is that was Monticello one. Yeah. That was the early Monticello that we've always wondered how extensively Monticello one was finished, how habitable it was. Well, clearly it was habitable enough to invite some oh. very influential guests. Right. We have, Bill's research has taken him to know the, 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 you know, the notable people, the famous people. Um, We've recently, in curatorial, we've recently found or received as a wonderful gift a letter um, from a collateral Jefferson descendant that talks about the way that, that she celebrated Christmas. Um, she is, there's a letter from a young woman and her identity eludes us. Part of the letter is missing. And it may be, it may be good that, that her, her she's not known. Um, she's writing to a friend and her friend is up in Baltimore and Baltimore, you know, the cities were really, were really active socially right after Christmas. Um, Richmond has its party season right after Christmas, Baltimore is as well. But you know, she, this young woman is stuck down here in central Virginia with not a whole lot going on. But she describes that she's been to Monticello and she's had dinner with Mr. Jefferson and Nicholas Trist and Ellen, and you know, basically she can hardly get a word in edgewise because all of these, you know, very well informed, very comfortable with one another people are talking. But she still says it's wonderful, and they have this great discussion about um, about literature after dinner. But that's that's on one page of the letter. The other page of the letter is this very funny telling of she's basically picking fights with another young woman who's staying at Edge Hill. She's messing with this young woman's hair. She's, messing, she's brushing ashes from the hearth back into the fireplace and kind of snits at her with, with the broom. And you know, she says in her letter, why am I telling you all this? Well, it's because I am very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear it. So it did happen, right? It did happen. And she goes on, she says, like, basically, if I can hold myself together, if I can keep it together, then there will be some more celebrating this afternoon. Oh, that's <laughs> so, wonderful. Oh. You know, we, we hardly ever hear in the record someone say flat out, I am very, and I, she might have even emphasized very, I am very drunk as a young woman. And it's, 
it's just, it's really, it just strikes me as so funny because, you know, sometimes um, overindulging may also be a, a holiday tradition yes, that extends well, yeah. into the past <laughs> and continues into the present. Oh, that's beautiful, Emily. <laughs> History's alive and breathing and drinking still. Indeed. <laughs> Do we have any more questions from the pub from the public? I've got one more question that okay. I can ask, Bill. Um, this one is for you specifically from Michelle. Um, she asked, "What things about Christmas would you say that you and Jefferson mutually enjoy? And there are any ways that you and Jefferson differ on your perspectives of Christmas?" Ooh, very good, Michelle. And I'm going to turn this to you too, Emily. <laughs> after, after, no, absolutely. I, I can tell you what I have come to enjoy about Christmas Tide uh, being here with Monticello, and that is um, uh, trying to reflect on the sense of the wilderness that uh, that Jefferson would have been born into and grew up with, the, um, the forest primeval, and, and to realize no light pollution uh, during these shortest days of the year, and what must have been blankets uh, of the stars uh, in, in the sky. And, and to realize when you're talking about Christmas dinner, how it had to begin while there was still daylight so you could see the food on your table, you know, uh, before the candles will be brought and, and lit. And then to realize in this wilderness, you only had one and the other. And, and how long would you be able to see and gather with one and the other? As, as you well know, the death rate was extreme and young children passing away at such an early age as happened with, with Jefferson's uh, children with Mrs. Jefferson and happened in his own family as well. So at this time, with the shortest days, the darkest days, to be able to gather with one and the other, to see one and the other, to enjoy repast, to enjoy libations, let alone the meals and the elegancy of the, uh, the French cuisine presented here. My heavens, family, mm -hmm. for all of the families, for all of the families. And, 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 and is that not something that helps pull us together? This is what I've come to reflect on here. Um, I even wonder, as you ask me what I would find um, to be different about how I feel about it uh, as me, I, I would often wonder, will, that, will I be able to see that individual next Christmas time if we only visit for the greatest extent at this time of year? Uh, you, you wonder of all of the opportunities we have to visit more often, travel more often, uh, provide more presence uh, to, to everyone. Uh, what would it have been like to, to go back? Uh, the purity is, is certainly fetching. The intimacy is fetching. But so much that we would have had to suffer in regard to maintaining good health and, and hygiene and, uh, and particularly clean water. What do you think? No, I think that's absolutely right, Bill. And honestly, something that you said really makes me think about how important that was the that was the reason that enslaved people were asking, were, were requesting permission to be able to walk 90 miles down mm. to Poplar Forest in the winter. It was to be with family. It was to be with family and friends. And again, like all those uncertainties that you mentioned, the, the question about, will I see this person next Christmas? Will my health maintain? All those, all of those questions, that's, that's, I think, a really important shared component about the way the holiday was celebrated in the Jefferson family, mm -hmm. but also the way that many people in the enslaved community being able, you know, maybe they didn't, maybe someone didn't have to go to Poplar Forest, but to be able to visit a friend at a neighboring plantation, to have that permission and to have this time of year where you can, you can do that without having to sneak, without having to you know, risk being caught or punished. You have time, like the commodity of yeah. time is, is something mm. that I think the enslaved community so infrequently got to experience. And that's, that's a really powerful part of the holiday. Um, for me, you know, thinking about 
often when we when we think about Jefferson, it's we're we're often so focused on the essentially important things that Jefferson did, the the ways that he shaped our modern world and the the world that we continue to live in today. And what I love about the holidays is that it gives a glimpse into a Monticello that was fun. You know, where where people are, where music is playing, where people are dancing. Um, it just it's it's a it's a bit of a balance. You get you know the the seriousness of of Jefferson's contributions, the seriousness of the experiences that enslaved people were going through, and then you get this little glimpse that there was music, there was food, there was there was coming together. Like to me, that's a really compel really wonderful, heartwarming something that I want to try to take into my own memory as I'm thinking about the holiday. Exactly, particularly with the hope that the days are going to get longer after this solstice. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Great, well, thank you both very much, Emily and Bill. Thank you for joining us today. It was a great conversation. And thank you all for joining us online. And we'll see you next week for another Monticello live stream. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Thank you, thank you, Bill.